Hi, good afternoon. I'm Deacon Ed Schoner with the uh, permanent deacon with the Diocese of Scranton, and I'm also a member of the National Catholic Partnership and Disability Council on Mental Illness and Wellness. And I come to this topic because, like uh, I'm sure many of you, I have a deep personal relationship to this. Uh, my daughter, Katie, had bipolar disorder and lived with this mood disorder for many years and sadly uh, died by suicide in 2016. And after she died, uh, we, we published a very short obituary talking about how uh, she lived with this illness. Uh, she died by suicide, but she was a beautiful creation of God, uh, loved by her family and loved by many of her friends. And uh, she shouldn't be defined by this illness or either her manner of death. And uh, that obituary uh, went viral. And you know, neither Katie or I are celebrities, but it apparently spoke to what so many people who live with these mood disorders, anxiety, and depression experience. And it was that personal connection in particular, that response to my Katie's obituary that, uh, that launched me into this uh, aspect of uh, ministry. And I'm so glad I, I'm in it. I'm, uh, have joined with a number of other people and formed a, a group called the Association of Catholic Mental Health Ministers to uh, start uh, mental health ministry in Catholic parishes and communities uh, around the world. So I'm glad all of so glad a lot of so many of you are here today. Uh, this seminar or webinar is probably most of you know was sponsored by the Institute for Human Ecology at uh, the Catholic Uni University of America and as I mentioned co-sponsor with the National Catholic. Uh, partnership and disability. And just a brief description of the Institute for Human Ecology at the Catholic University. It's an inter interdisciplinary institute that's dedicated to bringing the riches of the Catholic intellectual tradition to bear in contemporary conversations. And the National Catholic Partnership and Disability uh, works collaboratively to ensure meaningful participation of persons with disabilities in church and society. Uh, and I guess I've, I see here in my notes uh, here is that NCBD has been working with the um, Institute for Human Ecology for many years now, since 2019, to plan disability events uh, that pertain to the life of the church. So it's good that these two important organizations collaborate with each other on this important topic. Joining me today for this uh, discussion are two very good people, very experienced people in this, in this field and very committed to what they do. Uh, the first is Mary Bell Laguna. She's a licensed professional counselor in Dallas, Texas, and she's the owner of uh, Core Sacrum Counseling and Consulting uh, Services. She's also a board member of a wonderful organization, the Catholic Psychotherapy Association. And Mary Bell has over 14 years of extensive experience working with all age groups, adults, adolescents, children, couples, and families on a wide variety of uh, mental health related issues. Uh, also joining us is Mike Eisenbath, uh, and he's a former award-winning sports writer who lives with uh, severe depression. He's in the St. Louis area. For those of you that are, uh, you know, a little older like I am, I know he spent a lot of time writing about Mark McGuire back in Mark McGuire's heyday with the, the St. Louis Cardinals. Uh, he's also written a book uh, about the Catholic faith and mental illness and writes on many, many uh, Catholic uh, publishing platforms like the Christian Review, Catholic Lane, and other things. Uh, and I'll tell you, I, the, uh, I first ran into you, Mike, uh, when back a couple of years ago, well, ran into you virtually at least, uh, because of one of your articles that you wrote that was published on one, on one of these Catholic platforms about uh, how you were looking for a, uh, how you felt Saint John of the of God was an ordinary saint, uh, who is uh, who lived with uh, depression in his uh, in his life, and of course lived a good life, uh, is now recognized by the church as a saint. But this but this notion of uh, of, of, of of folks being able to live with these illnesses, lead good lives. Uh, the illnesses don't go away, but you can lead a good life. You can learn how to live with the illness and learn how to manage these illnesses. And I think that's an important part of your uh, message and your story, Mike. So perhaps you could share with the audience what I've, what I've come to know and appreciate about your story. Uh, and just take a few minutes. People always like to hear stories, and uh, you're a good storyteller. So if you could take a few minutes to, to share with all of us uh, uh, your, your walk with uh, and your how you've learned to live with the depression that you uh, experience. Thank you, Deacon Ed, and thank you for allowing me to be with you all today. It, uh, 
it certainly is a pleasure and a great honor uh, to to talk about a subject that is, uh, I think, maybe it maybe the pandemic helped us a little bit in some ways to be able to talk about this a little more openly, and I think uh, erase some of the stigma. I certainly think it it hasn't gone away entirely, um, but I think there are people that feel a little more comfortable talking about it in some circles at least, and uh, and I'm grateful for that. Uh, it wasn't that way uh, when I first was diagnosed with depression. Um, it was uh, a little bit about part of my story. In uh, the winter of 2001, 2002, I was 40 years old, four kids, a uh, wonderful marriage, really active in my church, parish council president, uh, participated in retreats. Uh, we, uh, we were involved in the church with leading uh, the youth group at our parish. Um, and uh, I was very successful in my field. I was a sports writer and a beat writer for the St. Louis Post-Dispatch covering uh, the St. Louis Cardinals um, and doing what I had always dreamt of doing. Uh, and and honestly felt called to be a dad and, and and everything else. And that winter, I noticed that I was having difficulty getting out of bed a lot of times. Um, and it, it didn't alarm me too much at first. It had been a long summer covering baseball and I had a lot of, you know, comp time. And so I didn't necessarily have to go into work every day. Uh, but it got more and more difficult. And as it got close to going to spring training, I felt a lot of anxiety about having to go back into that. Uh, and uh, the, the difficulties just getting out of the house many days uh, was overwhelming. So I did go to my primary care physician and he diagnosed me with uh, major depression and severe anxiety. Uh, began um, taking, you know, antidepressants just like anybody else would at that point. Uh, but I did leave my job because I, I, I couldn't get out of the house a lot of days. If I got out of bed, I couldn't get out of my recliner. Um, so it was uh, an extremely difficult period that only got worse, to be honest. Uh, so over the course of these last 20 plus years, um, I've tried every antidepressant that has been created as far as we know. Um, I've tried uh, electroconvulsive therapy, uh, TMS, uh, transcranial magnetic uh, stimulation, uh, relatively new uh, thing that's available out there. Uh, I've uh, tried ketamine infusions, um, been hospitalized several times because of suicidal thoughts, and I have uh, attempted suicide three times. Uh, the last time, uh, I just celebrated my 11-year anniversary of that last suicide attempt, uh, and it caused a major seizure, um, and I nearly didn't make it. Um, all of this time, um, I've held pretty firm in my Catholic faith, though. Uh, and it's been between that and my family, particularly my wife, uh, that, that's what's kept me going and kept me alive, quite honestly. Um, and I, I, I'm not sure why. I can't, I can't totally explain why. I think it's you know, just a gift of grace that God has given me that, that faith to always cling to him. Uh, a lot of times it was yelling at him. A lot of times it was questioning. Uh, there have been severe periods of darkness where I didn't feel his presence at all. And yet I continued to reach out and believe that he was there. Um, I've written about a lot of this. I did write a book, uh, and it's based on the prayer of Jehoshaphat, which uh, it, it's a story that's found in the second book of Chronicles, chapter 20, uh, and very briefly, just to let you know, Jehoshaphat was a king of Judah. Um, and to boil the story down to a, a short tale here, uh, there was an enemy, three enemies actually, 
coming to attack Judah. And uh, Jehoshaphat, as the king, called all of the people together, and they were prepared to find out what their battle plan was, and instead he prayed in front of everyone. And the crux of his prayer, I boiled down to a prayer for me. And he prayed uh, basically near the end, oh God, can't you see this enemy coming at me? I'm powerless against it and I don't know what to do. Hence, I turn my eyes toward you. And that became my prayer uh, every day. Uh, where I would wake up and uh, the heaviness was there where I wasn't able to get out of bed. Some days, if I did get out of bed, my victories that day were getting out of bed, getting a shower, and getting dressed. Uh, and that was the best that I could do. Uh, but every day, I would say that prayer, and I'd say, look, God, I, I don't have the power to deal with this to, right now. I don't know how to fight it. Uh, the medication doesn't work. I'm in that 30%, that, and Maribel can talk with you about that, that doesn't respond to the various treatments that we have for depression. Um, and, and I've learned to cope over time with tools, but the greatest tool I've had is my faith. And uh, even when I'm angry, even when I'm uh, filled with doubt, uh, and sinful, making mistakes, um, I still turn toward God in all of that. Uh, and I've, I've tried to take that message to people and, and really be there for a lot of other people through all of this. Uh, one thing that I found is when you share that vulnerability and that story, um, it's amazing how many people are dealing with the same thing. And my wife and I have done a lot of talking on the subject. And inevitably, what happens at the end of our talk, we kind of split up, and uh, she talks from the caregiver side, and she'll have a line of people that want to talk to her about the people in their life that have depression uh, or any kind of mental illness, and I'll have the people in line that are dealing with it themselves. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's powerful to see that, uh, but it's powerful to, to let people know there still is hope you can live with this. Yeah, thanks for sharing that, Mike. You're absolutely right that uh, you can feel abandoned people that live with depression. Uh, it affects not only their relationship with each other, but it affects relationship with God. You can feel as though you're abandoned by God. Uh, I'm, you know, my Katie was probably in the, the, the same 30% you are that she was, uh, the, the medicines didn't obviously do well for her, although she, I always say, take the medicines. She lived much longer than she would have if she didn't have the medicines, just like chemotherapy doesn't always cure every cancer, but can it prolong your life. The same thing with medicines. I'm fortunate. I'm in the 70%, I guess, that does respond to medicine. I have to deal with depression, which is like the common cold. Some people joke, it's like the depression and anxiety is like the common cold of uh, mental illness. And, uh, and you're right, it, co it comes in like a fog. You have no control over it. You really don't. I, it's when people say buck up and get over it, that's just not possible. It comes in like like a flu, just like a like a regular flu. And you, you learn to live with it. You learn how to manage it, like you said. But uh, but it but it is it is an illness. Um, so maybe Mary Bell, you can talk a, a little bit about you know we've been reading a lot over the last few weeks about reports coming out about the uh, uh, the the increase in anxiety and depression and mental health concerns with uh, young people. But as you know, two old guys like Mike and are still talking. I mean, it, you don't get a pass on it due to age either. Uh, and it seems to be, uh, from what I can tell, at least I'm not the professional like you are. What I can tell across the spectrum of ages. So. Uh, maybe it'd be helpful for our audience for you to talk a little bit about uh, when depression, anxiety, and maybe even some of these other mood disorders come on and uh, what how it affects us throughout our throughout our lives. Oh, thank you, Deacon Ed. Um, first, I just want to say thank you for the two of you for sharing your story. I really think it puts flesh on some of these stats. Um, some of the stats are pretty sobering. Um, I would say this recent stat that came out of the CDC that says that 57% of teenage girls are reporting um, feelings of sadness or hopelessness. 
and 30 something percent are um, reporting having pretty serious suicidal ideations. Um, I think that it's very safe to say, kind of based on what Mike was saying, um, one, based on stats, but also anecdotal data, that we are in a mental health pandemic. And it, I can say for myself and my practice, I have seen a, a big boom in terms of requests for therapy. And every single therapist that I know um, who's established has a waiting list. And so um, we are just in the middle of it. And these stats from the CDC show that, that it's affecting obviously teenagers. And I would say that mental health illness really shows up in these um, developmental pivotal moments in our lives. Adolescence is one of them. And there's just so much happening in the brain during that time that makes us really vulnerable to mental health issues emerging. However, in my work with um, people across the lifespan, I've seen um, kids as young as five with um, bipolar disorder. And so, you know, it's a real thing that's starting, I think, younger and younger, we're becoming more advanced in our understanding of the brain and our understanding of behavior and symptoms. And I think, honestly, this mental health pandemic will be the source of a lot of research that will help us start identifying mental health disorders early on. Um, so I think early intervention is key. One of the things that helps with early intervention is obviously exposure to medicine that helps people have fewer relapses or have a relapse that's less um, chronic. And so that's really important. Um, also other developmental milestones, right? Middle school. I mean, who liked middle school? <laughs> I think every single person can identify a trauma that started middle school. Starting high school, going to college. College is a big time for mental health disorders to really emerge because kids um, or young adults are plucked out of their safety zone and put into a very new environment where they have no support system. They're having to manage all these responsibilities on their own. And then on top of that, they're exposed to like some really like unhealthy ways of coping, alcohol and drugs, um, or um, you know sometimes some promiscuity or pornography addiction. And it's all and it, there's no supervision really to help them cope in healthy ways. And so um, we're also seeing a big boom in college age students with mental health issues. Um, I was talking to a friend earlier who um, is a director of a counseling center at college campus, and he told me that he had to triple his staff, okay, in the last three years. And I think these, um, and again, anecdotal data, but, you know, it speaks into something that's happening in our world today. And so we need to kind of watch out for these developmental milestones and, and just when mental health how that puts us at risk for mental health issues to emerge. So do you see, it, I get this question a lot when I go around talking too, do you think there's something different going on today that's causing this increase? Is there something different in the, the culture or society? Or do you think it's just, or you think it's more that people are more willing to acknowledge their struggles and go get help? Or what, what do you think it is, those two factors, or is it something else that's going on out there? Uh, do you have any sense of that? Or is there anything in the literature? Uh, that you know gives us I don't a think incident. I don't know if there's anything in the literature about it um I'd have to go and do some research <laughs> on it but I I would say just from maybe observation but I think it's probably a little bit of both um one thing is that we are not endorsing religious beliefs as much as we used to and kind of what Mike was saying one of the things that really has gotten him through his struggle is his faith. And positive psychology has done research on this and people of faith are just more resilient. And so when we throw out God, like are we throwing out a coping skill, a way of coping? Now for us Catholics, we know it's not just coping, right? But you know, it's a big source of hope. Also people with faith have more hope. And, and so you can just put two and two together. <laughs> and we're built to be in community. We're not built to be exactly. isolated. Christ, um, God made us to be to be together as, uh, with each other. Yeah, I've seen those literature, uh, the literature where it's pretty clear that uh, um, uh, 
faith and membership in a religious or faith community is a protective uh, factor in helping to manage depression and anxiety, just being around other people that, that understand. Uh, and that's one of the things that we try to do and the NCP does, NCPD does and other organizations is build up what we call a mental health ministry in uh, parish and Catholic communities where, where we can be more open uh, talking about these things in the context of our faith. Because the stigma used to be so bad that you wouldn't even feel comfortable talking about it in your parish community or in your own faith community. And I think slowly that is starting to change, that's starting to break down, it has a long ways to go. But it'd be wonderful if someday where uh, uh, the Catholic Church and other faith communities uh, were thought of as, well, that's the first place I go. When I start experiencing mental health struggles and problems, that's the first place I go to find comfort and consolation and support and healing. And I, I think webinars like this is, are, are one way to start to chip away at things so that so that our faith community is seen as the place you go when you're struggling like this. Um, so on that note, what are some of the things that uh, Mary Bell and Mike, you've talked about a little bit in your personal, personal story of, uh, of, of how you do get help? Uh, how do you, if someone's out there struggling with their sense of anxiety or depression, or they know their, their child is, uh, how would you suggest they at least take, take those first couple of steps to start to get help and see if, they, see if they really are struggling with this and get a diagnosis and get into treatment? What would be some of the first? Well, I know, I know one of the things that, you know, a lot of times when, when people have heard that, you know, I was feeling, feeling suicidal um, or just, you know, that sadness was so powerful. And, you know, one of the answers or one of the things that a lot of people will bring to you is, but you've got so many people who care about you and love you. And, you know, you've got so much to live for. Um, that's, that's difficult to hear because you know all that and yet you feel this way. So that kind of throws guilt at you. So I think sometimes instead of telling people that they have folks in their life to love them, uh, that, that love them and care for them and everything, show them. Be, being there for people, being present. Um, I, I like there's, there's uh, I was involved in Stephen Ministry and one of the, the little drawings they have is they show a person down in the bottom of a hole and someone up on top willing to help them. Um, so, you know, you could, you know, throw them a lifeline, but, you know, the person who's feeling that bad might not have the strength to grab it and pull themselves up. Um, you might reach down and try to grab their hand and help them out, uh, but they might not feel like they're love worth worthy of love. I, I got that way. I knew God loved me, but I didn't feel like I was worth loving. So that was a problem. Um, so sometimes the best thing you can do, I think, is jump in the hole with them. Now, it doesn't mean you get depressed with them, but just be present with the person and let them know that you care enough about them to just be there. I think that's the, the biggest benefit I've gotten from therapy is that someone was willing to listen um, or sometimes just be quiet with me. Um, and quite honestly, uh, praying with people is a very, very powerful thing. So, you know, even if they don't want to pray with you, at the, just being there and, and praying in their presence, um, I, I think, can be a powerful thing as well. Yeah, I often equate this ministry, mental health ministry, as like bringing the light of Christ into a dark place, into into the tomb, so to speak. Uh, they, because uh, it's it's there's other ministries in the church. It's not like doing uh, with with young children and coloring nativity scenes. It's, that's not what this ministry is. It's it's a very challenging ministry of accompanying people to use one of Pope Francis's favorite words, to accompany people and sometimes go into very uh, dark places with them, very difficult places, and to accept them for where they are, uh, to accept them and welcome them into the church without a demand for a cure, uh, that we can love people that are in depression, we can love people with serious illnesses such as schizophrenia and other things like that, but even milder forms of these illnesses, the anxieties, uh, 
scrupulosity, which is a word that's often used a type of anxiety within the church, uh, uh, that we, we can love them where they are and accept them uh, where they're at. One thing I wanted to mention just before I forget it, if anyone's listening or if anyone knows anyone that's in this type of situation, uh, we talked to mention suicide a couple of times now. And, uh, you know, if anyone you know, or if you are experiencing suicidal thoughts, take them seriously, don't blow them off. That's kind of like, even if you don't have an intention of, of, of acting on them, but it's kind of like the similar viewers having chest pains or like a little tingling in the side of your face as a physical thing, you'd go get it checked out. So I want to just add that. And I, uh, maybe Maribel can talk about this a little bit, but this, if you start to get some, some, uh, you know, more than a passing thought about suicide, don't, don't self-stigmatize and not get help. A lot of people don't want to admit that maybe they do have a, a mental health condition or a mental health disorder. Uh, no, there's nothing wrong with it. There's, you're not, ab, you're not uh, you know, abnormal or weird or anything like that. It's a very common type of illness. And to go uh, get the help you need. 20% uh, of us at any one time are living with a mental illness. That's the basic statistic. And over the course of our lifetime, about half of us are going to live with a mental illness. So it's, uh, it's an illness, and we need to get it treated, and we need to uh, uh, manage it. Uh, so from a clinician point of view, how would you, uh, Mary Bell, uh, advise someone as to how they would, you know, once they start to see some maybe some signs, or how would they, uh, what should they be looking for, perhaps? both themselves and perhaps as uh, someone who loves, you know, loves someone, a child or a spouse, they see them struggling. How would you suggest they start to think about getting into the proper kind of care? Yeah, I would um, say that, I mean, some really good resources is obvious. I have to say this, but no, I really believe in the mission, the Catholic Psychotherapy Association. We actually just launched our directory, which is, um, actually organized by specialty and um, zip code. So if you're looking for EMDR therapist for, you know, trauma, and you can search by EMDR therapist in your um, maybe, local Maybe zip you code. could for a minute, just take a minute or two and explain what, the, I know what it is, but could you explain what the Psycho <laughs> Catholic Psychotherapy Association is and what their, what their mission is, why, they, why they've formed this organization. I think it's a wonderful organization and it's really needed because I'll just briefly say it's, it's and part of it's a response to a lot of people ask me, just as a, a non-professional, where can I go to find a therapist that will respect my faith? And I, that's part mm -hmm. of what the Catholic psychotherapy does. I know it does more than that. So could you just take a minute or two and explain it? Explain what the association yeah. does? I totally drank the Cooley. <laughs> yeah, well, good. Um, so good. I would love to share it. Um, the Catholic yeah. Psychotherapy Association, basically it's a bunch of professionals that we just nerd out together and talk about the integration of faith and mental health practice. And um, it started off actually by just a group of people that were therapists praying the rosary together. And I think it was like nine founding members and now we're 600 plus members and now we've gone international. And so um, there are psychologists. Um, we also have some spiritual directors, clergy, um, clinical therapists, clinical social workers, um, psychiatrists, psychiatric nurse practitioners, anyone who's a mental health professional and looking for ways to integrate that in a way that's both clinically sound, ethical, um, and then also, you know, evidence-based. And so we're do, we have a conference every year where we do a series of presentations. We do webinars. It's ongoing continuing education credits for mental health professionals, but also a resource for the community, which is why we launched the directory. And um, kind of our goal in these next couple of years, and, you know, again, taking advantage of the mental health pandemic, um, is to continue doing research and publishing at the intellectual profession, professional level. And so we launched our first professional journal integrating evidence-based mental health practice and faith. And so we think that that's where the battle needs to really be fought and the discussions need to be had is on the intellectual level um, so that we can see the benefit of, um, you know, not throwing away our beliefs um, in, preference of mental health practice like actually you can do both well um so yeah i would really invite everyone to check us out 
Yeah, it's uh, you're right, Mary Bell. I mean, we're mind, body, and and spirit, and all three things need to be integrated. Uh, and uh, the medical care is good, particularly with the mind and body, but sometimes our spiritual life gets uh, uh, separated. I guess uh, mm -hmm. might be a good way to put it. Kind of talking along those lines, Deacon Ed. I think one of the things that I found early on in uh, as I was trying to deal. Once I kind of accepted what I had, uh, I realized that I wasn't going to be able to battle this thing by myself. And so I really put together a team uh, to help me deal with this. And that included my psychiatrist to talk about all the different, you know, medical options that were available uh, and be there if I was suicidal to be able to call him and say, hey, I need time in the hospital. Uh, so I can be safe. That included my therapist, um, who right away, I told her, you know, hey, I'm Catholic. My faith is extremely important. My spiritual life, that's got to be a part of the therapy that I'm getting. Um, also, I, I found a spiritual director to keep me well grounded there. Um, and I also found an exercise partner. Now, that person has changed over time, but I did find that just walking uh, was a powerful tool for me. If it's, if it's a sunny and 70 degree day, I've got to use that as medicine for myself and be able to get out and, and just, you know, motion is lotion, uh, not just physically, but mentally also. And to find someone to do that with me who could keep me accountable and, and, and keep me doing that. Um, and then a couple of friends that I was able to rely on now and then. And I think putting that team of support together lets you feel like I'm not fighting this by myself because, you know, if you're punching against a wall by yourself, the wall is not going to go anywhere and you're just going to get really, really sore knuckles. But if you've got a bunch of people helping you push that wall, there's a chance it can move. Yeah, it's and a big part of it, Mike, and I've found it for myself and other people that taking that first step of acknowledging that you have a mental health condition that maybe you need to deal with. Uh, it seems like that first step is the hardest thing to do for so many people, just to acknowledge I've got something like I was mentioning earlier, it's, you know, if you have an ache in your chest or, you know, crimp in your knee, it's it's not a big deal to go to the doctor and and uh, get the treatment but if you're feeling depressed or anxious for i think some of the statistics are many of these illnesses and disorders up to 50 percent of them go untreated uh because of this self stigmatization or part of the culture you know many of us live in cultures where you know it's looked down upon if uh if you know, subcultures within the broader culture where it's looked down upon uh you're not macho enough or things like that uh so a big part of it's just overcoming this self stigmatization and going and seeing it. So, so let me ask you, Mary Bell, so you since you're the practitioner, so you got some someone who's reluctant to even acknowledge what would you, how would you start off with them like in the first session? I mean, what would you say to someone that you know, that's maybe there because their wife pushed them to get there? Or, you know, their parent pushed them to get you know, they got a little push, but they're, they're kind of reluctant to, uh, acknowledge that they have an illness. I mean, how do you help people start to uh, open up and to discuss things? Well, I just start off by acknowledging the elephant in the room, which is, it's very clear that you don't want to be here. Um, but someone in your life cared about you enough to get you to be here. And you were, you made that phone call. And so there's a little part of you that sort of knew that you needed to be here. And so what was it that sort of gave you the courage to make that first phone call? What is it that you need that, that you are looking for today? And then kind of just, again, they obviously have a goal. Otherwise, they would have never called or showed up. And so, you know, we need to honor that and just um, kind of stay with that. And then um, obviously, I do a full clinical interview and then, you know, I just say, this is a way of me figuring out how you got here. And so what I can see from your story and from, you know, some of the really difficult things that you've been through um, is that, you know, you, you probably do meet criteria for 
you know, X, Y, Z. Um, but I also know that we can work on this and that some of the goals that you have, let's say, oh, I, I want to be happier in my relationship or, um, you know, I just want to be able to go to work consistently. Some of the goals that you have, we can work on. But I also think that, you know, a goal that you need to have is in the, that's where I give my professional opinion. You, know, you have your goals, but then as a clinician, one of our goals together needs to be, we'll say, whatever, X, Y, Z. And then, you know, it's, it's sort of like this collaboration push pool. Um, it sets up the dynamic of the counseling relationship, which is we're working together as a team. You know, so I don't have all the answers, but we're going to work to find them. So it's not frightening. It's not like it's you're immediately prescribing medicines right off the bat. I'm sure that's something that comes later in the relationship if it's decided as needed. And the other thing I wanted to touch upon is, is that those of us that are not clinicians, and, and I'm sure you can speak to this too, Mike, uh, of helping friends and uh, parishioners or people in our congregations to get the to get to the professional like you Mary Bell to get to them to be able to talk to people about this uh I know for example myself people know my personal story and my story with Katie and I'm sure this is true with you Mike where where people will come up and talk to you a little bit about it and being able to have a, a open conversation about mental health and mental illness and tell people that it's okay to to go get help. Uh, there's a wonderful course out there. Uh, many people have taken it, but a lot more people need to take it. It's called Mental Health First Aid, just like uh, physical first aid, where you get you know you're not the physician fixing them up after the accident, but you're stabilizing them to get them to a, a physician. The same thing with mental health. You get the tools and abilities to be able to talk to someone about this, and enough confidence to be able to encourage your loved ones. Uh, to, uh, to get to the care they need, or your parishioners or, or, or other people in your life, your friends, to get them to get the care you need. So I think all of us can uh, educate ourselves on how to uh, have this conversation, sometimes called call an awkward conversation that, you know, I notice something's different. You're not, what, you're not uh, you know, was acting the way you used to behave. And there's, there's something and that we need to, let's, is there something we can talk about? Is there something going on in your life? And then be in a position to be able to make a referral. I'm guessing that's been in a case in your Mike, life, Mike. I mean, any, like I said, many of us that live with these conditions are, considered more approachable uh, by some people. Uh, I, I think what I found is a lot of times, you know, I, I saw, so I remember early in my marriage one time uh, where my wife was talking about something and right away I started giving her ideas about solutions. And at a certain point she said, look, I don't want you to fix the problem. I just want you to listen. And I've come to realize that that's really the, the place I can play in someone's life if they come to me uh, saying, hey, I'm, I'm struggling too, or just to, just to listen. And not, and because I don't have the answer that's going to cure them. You know, I might be able to say, hey, my psychiatrist is really good, here's his name, but that might not be the thing that's going to take care of things for them. What they need at first, I think, is just just to have their story told. You know, whether that's they're grieving the loss of something, whether it's they're in a job or marriage that they're not happy, something might have triggered this depression or this anxiety. Uh, kind of like what Maribel was talking, my first real depressive episode happened in college. And it was a combination of being away from home and a breakup with a with a girlfriend you know so it was triggered that way uh, so there might be a trigger or it might just be something that's kind of been below the surface and it's finally you know come to the surface but there there's something going on that that depression is manifesting itself with that's making this person's life very unhappy and before you tell them hey i've got I've got some ideas, just, just let them be heard and meet them where they are, hear what's going on, and then say, okay, what can I, how can I help you? Um, is it, do you need a ride to the hospital? You know, is, is that what you need? 
because you're you don't have the courage to go to your doctor on your own i can go with you you know find out what the person feels like they need in the moment and not try to necessarily cure them and also be aware that um the situation might be more than you're able to deal with or oh, definitely um, know your and, definitely know your boundaries for sure admit admit that and say look i don't this is more than i can handle can I, can I help you find someone who can help you out here? Right. But this idea of accompaniment, again, that's a, one of Pope Francis's favorite words, yeah, accompaniment. Uh, Mike Britt mentions this point. I think maybe you could it'd be good, Mary Bell, if you could just briefly discuss it uh, and help those of us that are not professionals clarify our thinking on this a little bit. The relationship between, uh, you know, genetics or and uh, chemistry, psychology, situational, I know no one of those things. Well, perhaps I shouldn't say that. I don't know. Maybe one for a particular person could trigger depression, anxiety. But what what are some of the underlying causes or relationships that uh, uh, can can cause anxiety and depression to come on? What's the current thinking? I know the science is always changing in this, but what's kind of the, the current thinking and the relationship between these things? Well, I think um, it's all of the above. Right. Coming together in this perfect storm. But um, kind of what I encourage people to do when I do psychoeducation is just like, when in doubt, look at your family. And, you know, I, I'm very open about this in public, which is I have a full family history of diabetes. Guess what? I'm pre-diabetic, surprise, surprise. So now I'm on medication to prevent, you know, the development of diabetes. And obviously I eat healthy, try to work out all that stuff. And I just use that kind of as a way of talking about mental health. You know, we all have our flavors of mental health issues, um, and we all have sort of a predisposition for that. If you want to know what the flavor, um, what flavor you have, just look at your family. You know, there's such a thing as, um, in like in the Bible, generational sin, but also, <laughs> you know, like genetics. Genetics, genetics is and part so, of it. Yeah, and some of the, some things, and you know, that comes in a perfect storm in different times in our lives. You know, if I ate unhealthy or if I didn't work out, um, maybe if I didn't sit so many hours, that would also help. But anyway, that's a different story. But um, then that would be a perfect storm for the diabetes to develop. Um, and kind of like what Mike was saying, like his first time in college was really hard. That was a perfect storm for him. And so we need to be cognizant of that. Um, so genetics, obviously your brain chemistry, also your situation, um, a different attachment wounds. So like a breakup might give a good example of that. Feeling abandoned, you know, that is prime time trauma, prime time for things to develop. And so um, there is some literature like on trauma where earlier intervention is very key. Because then um, if we catch it early, then we're not allowing the brain to kind of develop these negative cognitions that sort of get solidified in that part of our brain that stores trauma. And, um, and so, yeah, I guess be aware of your genetics, be aware of your circumstances, be cognizant of fluctuations in your mood or, um, you know, when you start evidencing symptoms. And our body, it speaks a language. And our body tells us when something's not okay, right? We have changes in our sleep, appetite, weight, physical symptoms, emotional symptoms, mood swings, irritability, that sort of thing. Spiritual symptoms that we mentioned earlier, buying, praying, meaningless, feeling like a lack of connection with God, social symptoms, you know, feeling in isolation, feeling like other people don't understand what you're going through. And so every single area of our life evidences these symptoms and are we paying attention to that so that we can get treatment early on that, that's a good point I, I do spiritual direction and um, there's often um, in spiritual direction is, is this discussion of what's called the dark night of the soul versus depression and what you just mentioned mary bell is a good way to try to discern the difference uh, depression typically manifests itself in all areas of your life Whereas a dark night of the soul, a spiritual dark night, or so, sort of just kind of zeroes in on spiritual matters. And that's uh, 
probably a good thing to be aware of is, is that depression, if you start to see it manifesting itself every place in your, at work and your relationship with your family, you, you probably, you know, I guess, I suppose you could have both at the same time, a dark night spiritual experience and a, and a depression. Uh, but uh, it's uh, to be aware of that. And I think it's important to also uh, recognize that you're not a bad Catholic. Uh, you're not a bad uh, spiritual person. Uh, um, and if, if you go get mental health care and get treated, you know, I, I think and anxiety kind of going, Mike. Yeah. you can, add, you know, kind of piggybacking on what Maribel was talking about, that self-awareness. And, and I try to do that kind of on a daily basis, actually, is to be aware. How am I doing today? You know, what's my depression level today? Um, and if I've got some energy, great. If I don't, okay. Now my self-awareness has to be, what are the coping mechanisms? What are the tools that are available to me to be able to be, and I have to be self-aware of the good coping and the bad coping. Um, you know, I've, I'm looking back at my family I've had an uncle and a grandfather who were alcoholics and we pretty much identified they probably had depression and that was the way they chose to cope with it. So I have to be careful with alcohol. Mm -hmm. um, I, the holidays become very difficult for me. Um, well, another of my coping mechanisms is to eat a lot of sugar and that's tough around the holidays because there's lots of candy and cake and everything around. So I have to be self-aware of all of that and consciously say, I'm not going to do that. And I'm going to use some of these other tools that I've developed over time. And that's where my faith came in. That's where my prayer life became really important. Uh, so time in prayer, uh, mass attendance, uh, sacrament of reconciliation regularly, that became a very valuable tool for me and is still that way. Uh, regular retreats uh, has been important for me. Um, and spiritual, good spiritual reading, uh, kind of immersing yourself in that faith and uh, in the examples of saints and, and just people who live good faith-filled lives. Um, and you have to be counterintuitive sometimes. Like Maribel said, part of the way depression can manifest itself or any mental illness is you want to isolate yourself, get yourself away from everyone else. The tool I've learned is I need to be around somebody. I, I need to reach out to someone. The beauty of life today is we can send text messages easily uh, where it's a little less effort to send a text than to actually dial a phone number and have to physically say hello to someone. Um, but if I can send a text message to, you know, one of the guys in my men's prayer group and say, hey, would you mind praying for me today? I'm having a bad day. I get that connection right away then. I get that response back. So creating those kinds of tools uh, and good coping skills instead of the negative ones uh that that self-awareness is important yeah and one of the things with the self-awareness you know um isolate and people tend to think with depression uh uh it gets sluggish and sleep and all of that's true but one of the one of the symptoms and god bless my wife she's come to realize this one of the symptoms of depression is you can get angry and grumpy uh and uh, short-tempered and uh that's something to be aware of. I mean, as I get older, I'm I, I'm more aware of that now than than I what I was uh, younger. But uh, just being aware of those symptoms. Uh, so uh, one of the things I wanted to bring up too, it, you talk about the faith a lot, and we're uh, coming to the close here. We'll be taking questions in a few minutes. But last uh, November of twenty. 20, no, the number November before November of 21. Pope Francis, you may know, he has a monthly prayer intention. Uh, they, the popes have been doing this for centuries. Well, Pope Francis, uh, first time he had a monthly prayer intention for depression for mental health disorder, uh, November of 21, and uh, which was, you know, incredible. It was wonderful. And, and our association, 
heard from the uh, the Pope's prayer network and offered them support. But it was, but Pope Francis, uh, even as the leader of the church, has been open about his need to get therapy from time to time. He talks about it when he was in Argentina as the provincial uh, of the Jesuits there. He, he had some tough times and went to get some counsel. Uh, counseling and therapy, and and in his remarks, uh, he talked about the importance, the indispensable, the importance, the indispensable need for psychological uh, support, uh, and of course talked about the importance of faith and how Christ's words are also important. You need both. Uh, so I don't know. In these few closing minutes here, before we go to questions, Mary Bell, maybe uh, how have you seen that sort of uh, support, both important psychological support and faith, integrate in the and I know you can't talk about any individual person, but in, uh, in in the treatment of someone, how do they? How does a person go about integrating their faith and their uh, psychological support in, in a in a good treatment program, so to speak? Well, um, I'm very honest with my clients and tell them that I am not a spiritual director, and I will leave that to the experts. But I think what um, we would need to recognize, kind of, you were saying this earlier, staying with in our lanes. And so I tell them my, my area is the natural. And, you know, I'm really speaking to St. Thomas Aquinas there, where he um, almost directly from the Summa written in the catechism, um, what he said about the emotions, or some people call them the psychic motors, depending on the translation. And so in the natural, right, we need to work on the natural and then, right, grace transforms the natural. And then at that point, when they're ready for spiritual direction, then I just refer them on. <laughs> but um, I think that just having that set up front helps clients know what, what's within my scope. However, mm -hmm. I do encourage clients to um, obviously develop a you know, positive coping skills plan. And within that, I encourage you know, visitation to the sacraments. There are so much that is psychologically beneficial about the sacramental life of the church that I don't think we can capture in a webinar <laughs> right, or in the next right. couple minutes. Um, right. And, you know, I give them examples also of meditative prayer and rote prayer and how that is very grounding. We, we have tangibles like the rosary for a reason. You know, if we're feeling anxious, we hold on to the rosary and we do that go through the beads and the prayers, you know, like you feel centered. And so um, I think it's very important for us to, con I encourage my clients to use that as a coping mechanism. And then um, I tell them, you know, if you're feeling isolated, it's hard for you to reach out to a, another human. Maybe you need like a spiritual buddy and they're there for you. And um, some of my clients have really kind of used their, um, guardian angels as support you know especially when they're going through trauma right. like i know that no one was there for me but i knew my garden angel was because you know xyz and so you know i just really encourage people to lean into their faith and to explore support groups within the faith so a diverse divorce recovery group a women's group a mother's group you know just other people that are in that same stage of life and so it's I guess the answer is endless, Deacon yes, yes. <laughs> and, I, and I do spiritual direction, and it's it's great when uh, a spiritual director can collaborate with with the therapist. Yes. I mean, not like you're calling every day and comparing notes, but but you know, for example, I I can think of a situation just not too long ago where a person I'm in spiritual direction with was was in crisis. The person called me. I immediately recognized it was not something a spiritual situation they were they were in psychosis and was able to get their therapist on the line and do a handoff like that uh where so a spiritual person should be able to or a spiritual director should be able to recognize some of these psychological issues and know when to get them over to the to the counselor but it's it's wonderful to hear you say mary but it's also important for the the counselors to recognize that uh, sp the spiritual life a spiritual director can really help support a person's mental wellness again we're mind body and uh, spirit so all of these things need to work together. Well, great. Uh, let's see. Uh, we got a few minutes left here, and maybe I'll go to a couple of the uh, the, the questions here. And uh, let's see some of the questions that come through. Well, this is one that I have noticed. It, again, it goes to, to younger people. Uh, person uh, questions here that they've encountered younger people who view depression almost as a badge of self-identification. They identify, you know, as a, as 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 the illness. And, 
and it seems more complex than this, but have you seen this when, how would you address this when someone does start to identify and, and make that an integral part of who they are in the world? I have to admit, I've seen a little bit of this cropping up too, that it's, uh, uh, so you're yeah. laughing. So what do you, what do you think, Maribel? So are we talking about teenagers here? I'm yeah, 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 right, right. Well, right. I just want to say like, how many of us have not tried on when we were teenagers, the goth identity, the popular identity, the cheerleader identity, whatever it is, you know, it's just a symptom of adolescence. And so um, my job is obviously to believe clients. Um, and so if they're saying they're depressed, I believe them. But my job is also not to encourage them to stay there, right? If you're not making progress and I'm not challenging you to get out of the anxiety or the depression, I'm not doing my job and I should fire myself. And so that's where I think a team approach really works well, right? I need to work with the parents so that we're both saying the same thing. Like, I understand you're depressed, but you still have to do your chores. I understand that you may be anxious, but, you know, you still have to go to school. So how are we going to make that happen? And so, you know, you part of working with adolescents, you do have to call them out on for lack of a better word, they're, they're BS, okay. <laughs> but also okay. believe yeah. them, believe them and challenge them, obviously, to get better. So, I was, okay, just challenge them and press them on a little bit. Okay, good yeah. advice. We all good need advice. it. Yeah. Here's another question that, again, this is another one that comes up quite often uh, as a worry. And the question is, how can over-spiritualization get wrapped up into mental illness? And how Ooh. can Catholics help peers who suffer from this problem. And what they mean by over-spiritualization is uh, a very religious person experiencing everything as a sign from God uh, uh, and, and, you know, not getting the, uh, the care they need. Uh, so I don't know if you experienced this, Mike, or Maribel, if you want to talk to this issue of, uh, we touched on it a little bit, this issue of you know, spiritualizing things. I, I think about it when, you know, you're, you're, you go to the funeral home because someone you know has passed away and that person in front of you tells the person, well, you know, everything happens for a reason and the person dying is just, you know, that God has a plan for that, that we'll find out someday. Well, you know, if that person was 25 years old and they died in a car accident, you know, no, I, I don't think God had them die in a car accident because that was part of some grand plan to deal with everyone else's life and teach them a lesson. I think sometimes we do inject God into areas of our life that it, it's just what happens. And I don't think God gave me my depression because he wanted to teach me a lesson or because he loved me less or because he loved me more or anything like that. It's just the illness that I got in this world. Um, now, I can use that as a gift and make it something that is in my vulnerability. I learn things from and use it as a positive for someone else. But uh, I, I don't think, I, I do think there is a certain, and Maribel can probably speak to this, I think there is a certain part of a mental illness that does go there and it does over spiritualize everything and um and i think maybe that's part of a coping mechanism for someone is it's their their way of saying you know it's not my responsibility it's god's responsibility um and i think what we need to do is help people understand that yeah, there is a spiritual realm, but you're living in the natural realm and natural things happen in the natural realm. So let's figure out the reasons for that, the ways to deal with that. Not everything is about the spiritual realm. Mike, I don't think I could have said it better, but I do want to add one thing. It's like, we're not angels. <laughs> we're humans. And we're called to live in the temporal realm for a reason. And so let's stick there. Let's stay there. And let's see what, yeah. And I do think it's a defense mechanism sometimes. And so as a therapist, I have to, you know, be savvy in the way that I work with that. Um, meeting people where they are, but also challenging them kind of like Mike 
like what Mike was saying, is taking responsibility for being stewards of their life, right? We're stewards of our body, we're stewards of our talent, we're stewards of our time, money, treasure, all that stuff. And so like you need to also be a steward of your mental health. And that's a responsibility that we have. Well said. So I have another couple of questions that have come up here about uh, uh, clergy, priests, and, and lay Catholic leaders in a parish community. But for example, one of the questions here is, what's your advice for a priest? And this would be unique to a priest, but uh, who in the confessional are often faced with the task of counseling people who are seek, seeking more than absolution. Uh, you know, they're seeking help for depression, addiction. But I would say this goes beyond just helping someone in the confessional. How can we better equip our priests and Catholic leaders for what you know Pope Francis calls the field hospital? Uh, so, uh, any thoughts on that? I have. I'll just quickly. I, I'm I'm asking the question, but I'm going to just quickly tell a little story about this issue that I thought was wonderful. I was on a trip to maybe many some of you have been there. I went to Knock in Ireland, the Marian apparition, the Marian you know uh, uh, shrine or site and they have the big basilica where you where you go for all the special masses but they also have uh, the working church so to speak that the people in the town near knock go to and in the church in this church they have all the confessionals there but right in the back of the church they have a therapy center too so you can walk out <laughs> you can walk out of the counseling center and right there there's a mental health counseling and therapy center talk about integrating faith and, and mental health care i mean they physically do it right in the church at knock at this great Marian shrine. So not many of us had that opportunity where we had the counseling and the, the, the confessional right in the same building. But in general, how would you, what would you say to a priest or a Catholic lay leader in their community about how to uh, better equip themselves to be able to, you know, go, go into the field hospital? To use I think kind hospital. of what we were just saying in a way, you know, as a priest is discerning what he's hearing to say, now, is this, is this a spiritual issue that you're having or is this a mental health issue? Let's, let's, let's try to decide here what the difference. When I go to confession and I try to go to a confessor, to the same priest every time, who understands that I have a mental illness. And so, you know, there will be times where I'll be confessing things and he'll say, you know, it sounds like that's something that's being caused by your depression and not by any sinfulness that you've got going on. Um, so maybe you need to talk to your therapist about that. Um, and he knows I have a therapist, so, so that works. Uh, but I think a, a priest maybe does need to probe, are you getting help for your, for your mental illness? Um, because you need help in a way that I can't provide it. I can listen to you. I can be here for you to talk about, you know, things you need forgiveness for, but you don't need forgiveness for your mental illness. You need, you need other kinds of assistance on that. And I think if you phrase it that way, that could be helpful. What do you think, Mirabel? No, I think that's great. Um, I think one thing I'd like to add from, I have a background in counseling psychology, which is a type of psychology that developed in counseling centers and where people were exploring their careers based on their personality type. Well, when you do personality assessments and choose a career based on that, ministers and therapists are in the same category. And so there's a lot of crossover. And so I think for um, priests, just becoming empowered in one, doing the mental health first aid, learning about psychological issues and the spiritual symptoms of different psychological issues um, can really give them the psychoeducation that they need to do differentiate between what is spiritual and what is psychological and sometimes it sometimes it's both and so being able to make that determination you know just in a brief conversation and like mike was saying introducing maybe parishioners to the idea of mental health it really goes a long way when it comes from a priest um, most of the referrals that i get are because of priests that i who i know and who they and I have had a conversation about the difference um, between mental health issues and spiritual issues. And so I think um, also priests building relationships with Catholic therapists or just, you know, there's other therapists that are not Catholic but are very well equipped in mental health issues and respectful of the faith. 
some um, building relationships with them. So they're kind of on your speed dial if you had something, a situation come up in your parish, and then they can sort of walk, talk you through that situation. Yeah, and the other thing I would add too is, um, uh, you know, I'm deeply involved with uh, with a number of other people in uh, encouraging uh, mental health ministries within a parish setting. I mean, it's a new type of ministry within the church. It's similar to like grief support or prison ministry, but a ministry that specifically focused on uh, accompanying people that live with mental illnesses and, and those that care for them. Uh, maybe we can put it in the chat. It's the Association of Catholic Mental Health Ministers. And that's that's the whole mission of the association is, is to help priests and other uh, clergy and other lay leaders how to start a ministry within a parish or a diocese or your Catholic community. We provide training resources on how to do this. Uh, and uh, it's just a new type of ministry. A another fairly uh, simple thing to do to introduce into the life of a parish is, is in the intercessory prayers. If you want to just start with one step, I mean, start using the intercessory prayers to pray for people that live with mental illness or schizophrenia or suicidal ideation, you know, name it right out in the, in the intercessory prayers, have, uh, uh, you know, uh, working into the homilies. Uh, you know, it's okay to preach on mental illness and mental health concerns during homilies. Uh, a lot of the, the scriptures, of course, revolve around depression and anxiety and things such as that. And uh, this month is a good month, uh, at least on May 15th. I think May 15th, I'm looking at my calendar here. That's a Monday, so it's not a Sunday, but it's close enough. But certainly on the, on the daily mass on May 15th, which is the feast day for St. Nymphna, who is the uh, patron for people that live with mental health disorders and mental illnesses. Uh, so there's lots of ways that you can integrate it into the parish community and then ask people in your community who like me and Mike and, and even professionals like Maribel can help out to support a ministry. And it is a ministry. It's not mental health care, Catholic social services, and that might have the therapist. This is a ministry to help uh, people to uh, uh, do this. And uh, yeah, so there's lots of, uh, uh, resources out there to start a uh, mental health ministry within a uh, parish community. That's certainly one thing I would suggest people take a look at. Let's see, before we wrap up, if we have time for one, uh, one other question here. Uh, what about scrupulosity? This has come up a couple of times in the, in the, in the chat here. So we only have a minute or two, but uh, Ooh, do you deal with scrupulosity much in your uh, practice, Maribel? And uh, I know it's, I, I know Ignatius talked about it 500 years ago. It's, there's nothing to the and sun with Luther had OCD too, so. Okay, you know, okay. You, know, you, you can wanna... go Ignatius route or Luther route. Yeah, okay, but, well, yeah, we um, got to pick one. We got to enough. Uh, I know, one. Uh, but I'll just say really quickly, um, OCD, I think it's, I was just talking to a client about this yesterday, it's very common with Catholics. And, we, you know, we like the rules, so that invites some OCD tendency. Scrupulosity basically is, over focusing on um, sin when possibly it's just an obsession with a mental illness. One good book that I have on my bookshelf is The Doubting Disease. Um, so if you want to learn more about scrupulosity, that's a good one. If you're a spiritual director and encountering a client with or you know person with scrupulosity, also refer to a mental health professional. Okay. Yes. It, it, yeah. It does seem to be a somewhat more common uh, malady for, uh, for for us Catholics, the scrupulosity uh, for, I guess, a variety of reasons. But if, but if you do suffer from scrupulosity, don't feel bad. It's been around for centuries and centuries. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's, it goes all the way back to the early days of the spiritual exercises. Well, I think we're about at the uh, conclusion of the time here uh, for, the, for this webinar. So thank you to Mike and Maribel. Uh, in the chat, you can see links to uh, many of the things we talked about. Uh, and uh, you can go to the NCPT page, you can go to the Association of Catholic Mental Health Ministers page and for the uh, uh, the uh, the Institute for Human Ecology to get more information. I also encourage you to go to their, their sites. And if you think this was a worthwhile endeavor, uh, you know, you can always use donations, can always use financial support. All these organizations uh, have to make sure the light bill gets paid. So you can always uh, take a look there if you feel uh, so inclined to want to uh, want to make a donation to any of these organizations. So I want to thank you all for uh, joining us this afternoon in this important discussion. And I'm, uh, you know, please uh, go to our webpage, respective web pages, if we can do anything more to help you. Thank you very much. Have a have a great weekend.